Well, <clears throat> well thank you. Um, I also wrote a book about seven years ago called A World Without Walls. It didn't sell that well, to tell the truth. <laughs> Although it was pirated in China, which I felt really good because I didn't think I'd ever written anything worth stealing before. Anyhow, my job is uh, to moderate the session. I shall be speaking this afternoon. Um, political leadership has always been complex, but I think it is more complex these days because leaders do not have the traditional levers in economic policy and social policy they once had. And this is because of that much maligned word, globalisation. And globalisation is not a policy, it's a process. It's been going on ever since man stood up and looked over the horizon. And it cannot be stopped any more than you can stop people thinking. It has been slowed. It was slowed in August 1914. It can be slowed. It was slowed by the disastrous Marxist and fascist detours. But in the main, our species has evolved and has travelled, has thought, has dreamed, has traded, has fought. And globalisation has certainly not meant the death of the nation state, as was predicted. In fact, two thirds of the countries that are at the United Nations did not exist in 1945. Globalisation doesn't mean the death of leadership or of, of government. Governments matter as much as they always did, if not more. If governments don't matter, explain the difference between North and South Korea. If governments don't matter, explain the difference between Burma and Thailand or Belgium and Belarus. It's true that as consumers' choices have widened, political options have narrowed. And the nation state is only four or five hundred years old. Our international institutions are less than 80 years old. All this is work in progress. And it's true that sometimes things move quicker than our moral, legal, or even ethical and institutional capacity to cope. But we know one thing, that no nation can prosper without the cooperation of others. We cannot combat AIDS, have effective climate change policies, enjoy clean air, run a tax system, run an airline system without the cooperation of others. And we can no longer tolerate in a moral sense, but even in an economic, health and safety sense, failed states and rogue states, because these are not just the most unpleasant places in the world to live for their citizens. They're the places that become a haven for those who want to smuggle everything from counterfeit goods to terrorism to health problems and people to other places. They're a danger to us all. So it's not easy, but leadership still matters. And leadership is just not the ability to impose your will by force, but to persuade others to a course of action that sometimes is against their short-term narrow interest. That is the biggest problem in political leadership. Now, you've heard already too much from me. I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves, to spend three or four, maximum five minutes, sharing their lessons of leadership with you. And I hope that most of this session will be you asking questions of various leaders in front of us. Thank you very much. Uh, and to introduce myself. Um, my name is Jack McConnell. I uh, was First Minister of Scotland from 2001 to 2007. Our new parliament in Scotland is now 10 years old and uh, uh, I lost an election in 2007 after nearly six years as First Minister by uh, 24 votes in the final constituency. Uh, there was announced on election night by 1% and one constituency nationally. Um, I've tried not to be bitter about that and, uh, and move on. 
Uh, and I, uh, I currently act as the, the Prime Minister's Special Representative on Peacebuilding. And I also uh, carry out some work as an education advisor for the Clinton Hunter Development Initiative in Malawi and Rwanda. Um, as First Minister, I suppose it would be fair to say that my priorities were to try and increase Scotland's population by encouraging immigration. At that time, probably fairly uniquely in Western Europe, when everyone else was uh, taking a slightly different view of immigration. Uh, I think successfully, our population decline was reversed, and we've inc had increases in Scotland now for the last four or five years. And as part of that uh, priority, I was very keen to, in to encourage a multiculturalism, a celebration of diversity, and an attack on long-standing problems like sectarian or bigoted behaviour. So that's a bit of my background. I'm a mathematics teacher to trade. We have two kind of mathematicians or scientists together here. Um, I, uh, I, I think there are a couple of uh, points I would want to make at the start of this discussion. First of all, um, uh, it seems to me that there are three major issues for, uh, uh, in, in relation to this discussion on globalisation that require better, stronger and deeper global leadership. Uh, uh, those, those issues, of course, being uh, the economy, particularly the state of the, the uh, financial uh, aspects of the financial services aspects of the economy just now. Secondly, climate change. And thirdly, conflict and the response to conflict, uh, particularly, in my view, post-conflict reconstruction, avoiding the outbreak of conflict again where peace agreements have been established. Um, and I, I, I want to make uh, three very brief points about uh, how leaders should respond to that. The first is that I think national leaders need to think more globally. Uh, it is difficult to put aside short-term interests, national interests, uh, but it's absolutely essential. And I think that uh, all of us have a responsibility and a duty to encourage and support national leaders, more and more of them to think in that way. The second point I want to make is that global leaders need to remember the national. Uh, uh, the, one of the great uh, challenges, I think, in global leadership uh, is to be able to act globally, but remember that people live with a local identity. And if we forget those local identities, then we create tensions that will make it very hard to implement uh, global decisions. Um, and the third point, uh, brief point I would want uh, to make is that uh, it is absolutely essential that in taking on that global leadership role, uh, all of those involved do more than simply make statements. Um, my best uh, memory, perhaps my most acute memory of that, has been in recent years the, uh, uh, the statements of the G8 uh, in relation to Africa and development in 2005. Uh, strong commitments financially and morally made uh, back then in Scotland in July 2005. And yet today many of them uh, not realised, not carried through, uh, and in fact increasingly unlikely to be carried through as a result of the current economic crisis. And I think there's a real need to find a way in international institutions, uh, whether it's a G8, a G20, a G2, uh, or uh, uh, any other relationship, and particularly in the United Nations, the World Bank, uh, and the established institutions, to see through the decisions, to implement them in a transparent way, uh, and have a bit less bureaucracy and a bit more action. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, we have had uh, a previous uh, session where we both discussed some of these issues, but uh, I'll reintroduce myself uh, once again. Uh, I'm Radna Wasikirinska. In the period of 2002 until 2006, I was a Deputy Prime Minister of the Republic of Macedonia, and in two, well, I would say rather short instances, I was acting Prime Minister, which was uh, the reason why, why this title appeared on the program. Um, currently, I'm a member of the Macedonian Parliament. I'm heading the so-called National Council for European Integration, and uh, as, as some of the others, we're trying to be the opposition who is both constructive, not frustrated with the lack of power, but really interested in moving one step forward. And uh, as a consolation, probably, if we were in government, 
Some of us would not have made it for the ICD conference, having in mind all the difficult, uh, all the different uh, obligations. So this is the advantage of being in opposition for some time, not for too long, though. Uh, I, I want to make two comments, uh, and uh, because of the uh, time limit, I'll stick to the first one and then uh, use some of the questions to, to come up with the second comment. Um, I, I remember, uh, because we have been discussing a lot about climate change and environment, I remember the old saying that we, we used very frequently in the past about thinking globally and acting locally. I think we have used it so much that it has become a bore, so we never mention it in our discussions. Well, I would use this sentence in the context of global leadership uh, in building a world without walls. Uh, because uh, ICD was very optimistic and the session that we have to speak uh, today on is global leadership in a world without walls. Unfortunately, we are, we are still not there. What we need in this moment of time is world leadership for building world without walls. And I think, uh, although your comment was slightly in a different direction, that in order to preach world without walls, we have to be prepared to deal with the walls that exist in our local communities, in our countries, and in our regions. And usually this is actually more difficult, because for me, as, uh, as a citizen of Macedonia, it's very easy to, to tell Cypriots that they should solve their problem, and that it's absurd to keep on living in a, in a divided island for 40 years. For me, it is easy to ask our Bosnian friends that they should solve their differences. But uh, once I start dealing with my own issues and divisions and problems, it becomes trickier, especially when we are elected politicians. And when the public opinion is very favorable of uh, consensus and dialogue and solutions, but sometimes very, very critical when actually these solutions are on the tab table. And the morning session about Cyprus was very telling. Everyone is interested about finding the solution, and then it's offered to the citizens, and probably some of the politicians didn't do their job properly, and then it's not supported. So how come we are so eager to talk about other people's walls and so tough at accepting solutions and compromise when we're dealing with our own walls? And in order not to, 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 to just practice uh, this, this, bad, uh, this bad phenomenon, I'll, I'll say just a few words about uh, the walls that we have had and we are still experiencing in Macedonia. Uh, I have been, uh, as I said, a minister in one of the governments, but even before we were elected, we have participated in the discussions on a so-called Ohrid peace agreement, which, which was signed in 2001 after a short, relatively short conflict compared to some of the other Balkan experiences. And uh, the negotiations were not easy. Uh, the solutions were not popular, and the decisions that we had to make were tough. Uh, I do think that uh, in this moment Macedonia has passed most of its hurdles dealing with a divided community in terms of ethnicity, in terms of religion, and in terms of language. I think that the more visible political walls are behind us. We have broken them down with, I would say, a sound compromise. Nevertheless, I think that now we have to deal with more delicate, invisible walls. And these are especially walls that exist in our education, in which children of different ethnic background study in different schools, have different classes, they do not meet, and therefore it is easy for them to fall prey of stereotypes, hatred, and skepticism. And uh, this is why, now that we are celebrating the fall, the fall of this visible wall, I think that we should be more worried about the many invisible walls that we have been discussing about these days. The walls between different ethnicities, the walls between the citizens in Europe and the immigration, the walls between uh, m minority groups, which are sometimes marginalized and sometimes threatened. And I think that these uh, walls will probably be more difficult to tackle than the physical walls like the, like the Berlin one. So uh, I think that we have to take one step at a time. The visible, the invisible, and then I would say, according to me, the most difficult thing, the walls of indifference. Because uh, they exist when we are dealing with the problems, I don't know, in Africa, uh, we are not dealing with visible, even invisible, we are dealing with walls of indifference. 
indifference towards the others uh, that, whose pain and whose problems we are not experiencing on a daily basis. And this is why we, we do need global leadership. We, I think, should start from home. And then uh, having the arguments in our hands and having some positive experiences, maybe try to preach global leadership and the world without walls outside of our countries. Thank you. Thank you. You're very um, right when you say we can always solve other people's problems by way of resolution. I'll share with you, with you a story. The great Willy Brandt, the social democratic German leader, came to my country and came to my party meeting. And one of my very aggressive members of parliament stood up and demanded of uh, the great man why he didn't leave NATO, kick out the Americans, get rid of nuclear weapons and create world peace. Uh, Willie Brandt looked at this person and he said, I have discovered in a long political life, idealism increases in direct relationship to your distance from the problem, <laughs> which I thought was stunningly good. Excuse me. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I worked uh, all my life in uh, a university after the fall of uh, communism in Romania, I was elected by professors, researchers, and students, uh, president of university. And after I was uh, elected chairman of uh, National Council of uh, Universities uh, Rectors. Um, uh, I worked in civic society and um, I was elected uh, president uh, of Romania in the name of uh, the large coalition of uh, civic association and uh, democratic uh, parties. I uh, refused to uh, running uh, for a second uh, term in administration and I come back in uh, university and civic society because in my opinion is my duty, I consider my duty is firstly to rebuild a strong uh, civic uh, society. The very concept of cultural diplomacy <clears throat> seems to me uh, to offer an appropriate model of uh, leadership needed by a world uh, without walls. A leadership um, for which the political skill and behavior stand not alone, but uh, growing up in a full harmony with uh, culture, science, uh, and the highly theoretical and ethical vision of the present and the future. Of course, we know, at least uh, since Machiavelli, that politics are not about uh, redemption, but about uh, power. On the other hand, power without authority is powerless. And authority comes, at least in a democratic world, neither from ancestors, not uh, from uh, a divine uh, entity. It comes from each leader's capacity to embody a superior set of uh, values. To be a leader uh, means first of all to lead. For that, the leader must know the way better than his contemporaries. He must understand the aspirations and dreams for hers of his fellow citizens better than they do. Leadership for a new century means uh, a leadership for a knowledge-driven society. So the first duty of a leader is to know. In my view, the world tomorrow will need to integrate all technical expertise in a new comprehensive humanism. Maybe even the world of today is in pain for lacking the kind, this kind of integration. The challenges of technical development place an enormous pressure upon human resources. It is perhaps correct to state that uh, to form and develop human resources should be considered as one of the essential concerns for humanity as there is no technology able to produce the men and uh, women that use it. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
my name is Janis Jansha. I'm coming from Slovenia. Uh, 20 years ago, I was, uh, well, strictly behind the walls because I was political prisoner uh, because of my critical writing about that time's uh, communist regime in uh, former Yugoslavia. Slovenia at that time was not independent country, was not democratic, was not free. Uh, and I'm a clear example of the changes, changes uh, which have happened during the last 20 years. For this occasion, I came from my country without crossing any visible borders, without showing my passport. Uh, and uh, during this 20 years period, uh, my country and I, uh, well, used, <coughs> have used all opportunities which came after these changes which are symbolized by the fall of Berlin Wall. Uh, during the 2004-2008 period, I was president, I was prime minister of Slovenia, and during that time my country entered Eurozone, Schengen area. This is why I was able to travel free to Berlin. And in the first part of last year, Slovenia is first of new member countries, uh, ran also the presidency of the European Union. But all this time, from 2004 to 2008, I was also a member of European Council. Well, during our presidency term, also the president of the European Council. And I was able to, to share in uh, th this capacity the discussions and uh, <laughs> with, with uh, almost all uh, global political powers in the world during our meetings with China, Japan, the United States, Russian Federation, Latin America, African Union, uh, and so on, we discussed main global issues and also we discussed the leadership. Uh, and it had became pretty clear for me during this period that there are three main challenges the global world face today, and this, these are world peace and stability. Without peace and stability, it's not possible to solve other issues. The need for security is the first human need, and it's also the first human need of the societies, and the state, and the world as a whole. Then the second one is world poverty, or fight against world poverty. Without uh, diminishing this problem, it's worthless speaking about, you know, education, about development, about democracy, and so on. When people are hungry or thirsty, they will fight for the food, they will fight for the, for the uh, clean water, and this is the well, question of migration problem, and so on. And the third problem in the, we are facing today is climate change. And fight against climate change is a big challenge for the world. And uh, in this particular case, uh, we have the leadership, or we have had the leadership. And it, it is, uh, or it was, we will see what will happen after Copenhagen conference, in the hands of the European Union. Uh, I remember our meeting with uh, the uh, Latin American countries and Caribbean countries last year in uh, Peru. When we discussed this issue separately uh, with different, different groups of, of these countries and during the discussion with Caribbean countries, the presidents or, and prime ministers of the Caribbean countries uh, asked the European Union to go on because uh, <laughs> the consequences of the climate change are, are well, uh, very much clearly present in the Caribbean. I, I think we will 
hear something about it also in further discussions. And that uh, without uh, global leadership in this issue, it's not possible to expect uh, effective solutions. When we discuss this problem with, with, uh, with uh, Chinese President Hu Jintao and uh, Chinese Prime Minister Wen Jibao, they both told us that whatever regulation of car emissions the European Union will take, they will follow. And partially, they have already done this. So, to, to, to finish um, this introduction, I think that the question of global leadership today is the question of, well, right proportion between uh, competition and cooperation. And that, uh, uh, despite it's quite obvious which are the main global problems today, we are facing today, uh, it's also quite obvious that uh, we don't have world structures, global structures, uh, which can uh, bear these problems. And uh, it's not very likely that we will get these structures uh, very soon. So we need cooperation among all those who are prepared to, to, to solve these problems. We need intellectual leadership and we need cooperation. We don't need somebody to prevail and to be only one which is uh, able to solve these issues, but we need to cooperate uh, and uh, we need to contribute uh, compromise ideas and genius, genial ideas for uh, open questions. Uh, and the uh, conferences and congresses like this is, well, good way how to find them. It's uh, don't expect that all good uh, ideas and all good proposals, good solutions uh, will come from the politicians. It's, it's not like that. Sometimes there are good ideas, there are good solutions, uh, you know, lying on the tables, uh, being written in the newspapers, in the books, in the articles, uh, spoken widely by the, uh, by the well, intellectual communities. Uh, but uh, nobody from the political elite is, uh, is uh, uh, noticing them, sometimes because of uh, special political reasons, because every government, every politician, me included, wants to be re-elected, and uh, there are c calculations behind. Uh, but mostly because uh, those things are running separately. It's, there are very rare occasions where it's possible to discuss among, you know, uh, 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 how to say, mixed, mixed groups, mixed societies, where there are young people as the majority uh, in this audience, uh, the former politicians, current politicians, people from the university, from the intellectual sphere, and I think this is the best ground to develop good solutions for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, colleagues, ladies, gentlemen. Good morning. My name is Alfredo Palacio. I'm a physician, and always has been just a doctor. I'm a cardiologist. I graduated in the university of my country, Ecuador, Ecuador, and I did my postgraduate training in the United States, where I became a, a cardiologist. I decided to go back to my country to help my society, to help to, help to change the health uh, in my country. Since then, I've been in practice, I've been in academic medicine uh, my whole life and trying to change the, the medical structure in my country, which is uh, uh, obsolete. 
uh, I been reading a couple of books too. Uh, as a, uh, apparently, it's a it's a common problem also without uh, much of people to buy them. But uh, the books I've been reading are mainly in uh, medical books, uh, medical books or, or research books, and I wrote a book in regard to 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 the health system, the health as a right of the people. And uh, just recently, I had uh, I was obligated to write something about uh, about uh, politics. And uh, because of my proposals in regard to to the health care system reforms, about 12 years ago, I was appointed as Minister of Health in my country, and I started to make the, the changes in the health care system. And uh, I was in, in that position for two years. And after that, I came back to my university, I came back to, to, to my work with my patients, my colleagues. And um, in, 19, in 2002, I was proposed uh, to run as a candidate as a, for vice president of my country, and uh, we won that election. And uh, the, 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 my proposal, it was exactly the same, health reform. I was in that position for two years, and after, because of some political transformation, I became the president of my country uh, with the same idea. Made this transformation, but then I had to, uh, I need a huge scenery uh, because I have to face the, since the oil problems until the economical, financial, and some, some social problems, and gave me a huge idea about, uh, about what we need, at least in the region, and I think could be good for the world too. Then I decided to propose uh, a new world order since the South American point of view and since the biological point of view that I have exposed to you uh, the day before. And uh, I, I think that we need a new world order in which biology uh, would be the, the first axis and only the second to biology will be the law rules treaties and then the global economy serving always subordinated to the loss of life, loss of the universe, loss of the biology. I, I already told you about that, so last night I was thinking, what could I tell in, in, regard, in regard to leadership to my colleagues and mainly to these uh, young people who are the future of the universe and probably all of us will be in their hands. What, what, what could that say that could be useful since my, since my point of view that, as you already note, you realize that I'm not a, a, a politician in the, in the formal uh, sense of that word, what would I tell them? So I wrote a few ideas to develop here with you in these few minutes that um, corresponds to me. Uh, what I want to tell you is <laughs> What you know is that human dreams, aspirations, even needs, are, has, has no limit, has no uh, borders, has, has no frontiers, are beyond that. So the human dreams and aspirations are limited. When those dreams have a common ground for common people, then the leadership source. And that leadership, had to be, has to be at a world level. That could be done or could come from the leadership of a man, of a group, like for example ICD is trying to get that leadership in some areas, a country, United Nations. When, when that leadership is, is conforming and, and, and delineating, then the leadership means power. But this is not a power to impose by force or to impose by economical pressures. It is the power of the ideas, of the utopias. 
is what is being called, and I heard in this meeting, a soft power. That power of the ideas that we need in the 21st century it may be life, biology, it could be universal health insurance. It must be the right of health for everyone in the earth. It has to be that the first law should be biology, defense of life, preservation of life. It must be disarmament. It must be defense of the millennium development walls that apparently we have forgotten or we don't have enough money to do it. As we mentioned uh, the day before, the budget of the United Nations is no more than $27 billion. And uh, what we are spending in, 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 in what we need to spend for the Millennium Development Goals is about $50 million, so the double, about the double of the budget of the United Nations. So we need to reconsider from where we're going to take the money. Disarmament would be a good uh, way to do it. But uh, in summary, what could I say? We need, obviously, a soft power. And in a delicious conference that I heard last night from uh, President Constantinescu, he mentioned something that uh, impressed me, and I totally agree with that. He mentioned about an intellectual elite. Intellectual elite to perform a leadership now in this globalization uh, process that we are living. And that's a very important thing. That is the only way that the, the, the next characteristic, the leadership of our time needs, can be fulfilled is philanthropic. Philanthropic. Since when the creation is motivated by the ambition? I thought that creation was motivated by needs, by needs of the people, by love to the people. Beethoven did not revolutionize the music because he wanted to be a millionaire. Neither did Madame Curie. She did not want to be a millionaire. She didn't part in the radio. So, I think that the next important thing to be considered for the next future leaders is that they have to be innovative, they have to be philanthropic, and they have to be democratic. Leadership must be egalitarian, can move from one to another, cannot be monopolized by any body. Is not, it doesn't mean a climbing to a hierarchy. It means democratic, egalitarian. And I agree what it has been said uh, in this uh, distinguished forum, is that uh, we have to, to, to fight against the walls of indifference but also against the walls of ignorance. And I think we have to make this love plenty of love, which is the only way that we can preserve the life of our planet. Thank you. Well, thank you. I think you'll agree with heard some profound statements from members of the panel. Uh, the important part of this meeting is really um, you, the audience, participating and asking questions, and that way we can target 
and focus on your areas of interest, not ours. I'll just make one point on soft power. I think the best example of soft power in the last 50 years, uh, or a bit longer, has been the European Union itself. Um, I'm a New Zealander. I'm the first generation that haven't visited Europe in uniform. The great tribes of Europe are mainly at peace. The generosity of the major European nations uh, in providing structural support for Portugal, Spain, Ireland, one aiming at economic integration and also the integration of values, human rights and democracy, but also to provide funding and resources to ease that change from fascism and um, the difficulties of an inward-looking Ireland was a hugely generous act of genius. The success of Ireland bled across to the peace talks in Ireland. No longer was Ireland herself seen as the weaker partner and the poorest partner in the peace talks, but something that the North could talk to. This is a stunning example of soft power. Uh, when I was Director General of the World Trade Organization, we launched the Doha Development Round. Uh, the problem we have with international institutions is we don't have those kind of levers. So when I'm negotiating with Mali or the Caribbean uh, to further integrate them into the world economy, there is no way you can use the World Bank or the IMF or the great financial institutions in concert to provide the kind of package they need to adjust to further integration. So it's very unusual for a New Zealander uh, to be so supportive of the European Union uh, because before Britain joined the European Union we exported 90% of our products there, now 10%. But that's another issue in terms of world development as a model of countries keeping their identity celebrating the important things like their football teams, integrating the other issues of human rights, democracy and economic integration, I think it's an inspiration. still is because just joining the European Union benchmarks certain standards and values, just like joining the World Trade Organization benchmarks certain global standards and agreements. These are not small things. And this world without walls is not a world without values, standards, rules and ethics. A market without standards, rules and ethics is not a free market. It's a black market and it's dangerous and unpleasant. However, I've talked too much. It's up to the audience now to make some sense of this. When you stand up and ask your question, please identify who you are identify who you want the question to be directed at. Who's first? Mark, you're going to run the show. Sorry about that. Thank you. Dovolite, gospod Janez Janša, da vas pozdravim v slovenskem jeziku. Uh, my name is Anja Fabiani, coming from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia. I would like to thank uh, Mr. Donfried for preparing such a marvelous presentation and event uh, at the occasion of the uh, fall of the Berlin Wall. And uh, my question is following. Uh, speaking about the soft power, the diplomacy and everything, who else, if not me, would be more enthous enthusiastic about the uh, importance of the soft power in nowadays world, but uh, we are living in the society which is, um, let's say, uh, also has a strong need for peace and security, and this was your first priority, speaking about the world leadership. So, uh, yes, the story of Slovenia was the story of success, also of falling the walls, and you were one of the most important persons uh, in this story of uh, gaining the independence of the Slovenian state and the state sovereignty. But now I would like to ask the following. 
what is your uh, opinion about the uh, word smart power, which is now also very important, uh, for example, in the American uh, foreign policy and which refers to the region which we are in uh, and referring also to the lady from the Bosnia who was speaking yesterday, so uh, to, to have the flexible combination of the cultural diplomacy and other means. And the other thing, uh, I would like to support Mr. Palacio speaking about the philanthropic means of supporting the art through the philanthropy, because this is also my area. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> thank you first of all for your kind words. Uh, this afternoon I have a lecture uh, about uh, Slovenian path to independence, to democracy, and uh, I think uh, we, we can spare uh, this issue for the afternoon. But uh, the question was about uh, smart power. Well, uh, it's a relatively new term, but I think that those who invented it and who uh, are using it uh, think about the <laughs> combinations of different approach, which power to be used in which situation. So I, I, I don't think that this is something uh, which, is, which is speaking about new power. It's just about a uh, new approach, which is better than using just uh, military power, but you will disagree if, if I will say that it's better than using, using just soft power. Next question. Good morning, um, my name is Indra Adnan and I run the Soft Power Network based in London. Um, I'd like to address all of you, please. Um, it's a sort of three-pronged question. Um, the first question is, do you, are you now saying that the requirement of a national leader is to have the capacity to be a global leader as well? I think that's quite a high bar, but it's one definitely that I would like to encourage. Um, now, what are the capacities of a global leader? I think you've talked quite a lot today uh, and yesterday in terms of uh, the intellectual capacity could you also address um, the other kinds of intelligences that I think are required, certainly from the point of view of soft power, which is uh, emotional intelligence, um, and then also probably from a global point of view, spiritual intelligence. Um, is this something that every leader could have, or is there a question of looking at the community of global leaders? Um, where can we create a community of global leaders that perhaps between them can have intellectual capacity, spiritual capacity, and emotional capacity? Because it seems that when you look at the range of problems that you're trying to address, you need different kinds of intelligences at different times. Um, and then that comes to my third question, which perhaps is more controversial, which is that if you look at the global community of global leaders, should there be a better balance between a feminine input and a masculine input. Are these also two different kinds of styles of leadership? Do we have to begin to address this now when we're getting more and more ambitious about how we can create a new kind of leadership for the 21st century? Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> thinking quickly on my seat uh, rather than feet. Um, I don't think that we can expect every national leader to be a global leader. Uh, and I think if we set the bar too highly, then we will be disappointed and therefore uh, those leaders will fail uh, because the, um, the, the impact of that disappointment, disenchantment, will be uh, to reduce support for the kind of difficult decisions that, that Ramila was talking about. Um, what we need is national leaders who have a global perspective uh, some of them will provide leadership, either on individual issues uh, uh, or individual actions on the global stage from time to time. Some of them will be barriers to global progress. Uh, but it is essential, I think, that we encourage 
across the world more and more national leaders to have a global uh, perspective. Uh, I think uh, uh, the most successful national leaders will be those uh, who can develop the right uh, mix of serving the national interest and making a contribution to global affairs. And uh, you know, that combination requires uh, judgment, it requires uh, analysis, intellect, good advice, uh, a bit of uh, perspective. I think uh, uh, from time to time, in order to continue to make progress, nationally or internationally, leaders have to take the national interest into account. You have to bring people with you. But I think we all have a duty and a responsibility um, to lead and to be uh, ahead of opinion as well as reflect opinion. Um, and I want to make this point in relation to uh, 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 the way in which we approach international affairs as, uh, uh, as politicians, as, as political leaders, or in fact how the way other leaders should, should approach them too. Um, I absolutely understand the, 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 the need occasionally to refer to, for example, uh, aid and development issues, uh, or for that matter, like prevention work, in terms of the security of our own citizens and uh, uh, the need for cultural diplomacy, soft power work, uh, uh, in order to enhance our interests more effectively and more successfully, the exercise of smart power. Um, but I also think there's another side to this, which is that we have a duty and a responsibility to these issues, uh, and it's not just about our own interests. We shouldn't just want a more peaceful world with less conflict or less poverty in the world because that helps the national interests, for example, of European states, because there might therefore be less terrorism and less conflict in the world. Um, we should support these issues because we have an ethical and a moral duty to support these issues. We are largely responsible for the creation of many of them in the first place during the, the colonial years. And uh, I think in the world today, it is not just in our economic and security interests that more people are able to participate and realize their potential, but we lose in this world every year, every day, uh, the creative talents, the intellectual power, the ideas, the stimulus that would come from a better educated and a more successful uh, world. And I think that tackling poverty and development and conflict throughout the world is about the whole world becoming a richer place in terms of ideas and potential, not just in terms of our economy and our security. Uh, well, let the search for a superman or a superwoman begin. I mean, I don't think that we can find such person, let alone persons. Uh, I think that the global leaders uh, can emerge only if they manage to first present themselves and prove themselves to be good national leaders and then start thinking in the wider context. Because uh, I really think that most of the issues that were raised uh, here today, like the environment, the financial stability, peace and prosperity, are actually part of our selfish national interests. The European Union, uh, each of the continents have seen the negative consequences of wars in the neighborhood. Each of us is experiencing negative consequences of global warming or environmental damage. Uh, the, the problem that I, I, I think is more pressing is the short-termism uh, that we all suffer from in politics. You know, we all care, okay, the four-year mandate is uh, the bar. And I don't think about the consequences for the next 10 years. And I think that this is actually, uh, to a certain extent, a more limiting factor than the national interests themselves. But uh, going to the second question, I really think that it's impossible, as I said, to find uh, super people. Uh, I really think that it's a question of how do we envisage a community of leaders that will have different kinds of qualities. Uh, I do think that intelligence can be overestimated because we have seen in our history uh, enormous, enormous damage done to this world by very intelligent despots, dictators, uh, tyrants. So intelligence is one part of the puzzle. But I think that what is missing uh, a lot in our political debates these days is the question of values. It has become almost, uh, how can I say, not only acceptable, uh, but, how, um, uh, but uh, needed to be cynical and basically valueless. 
And if you are like this, then you can succeed in politics. And I think that these kinds of explanations are not helping us get the right people into politics. Most of the young people of today, unfortunately, will turn either to business or non-governmental sector or non-profit organizations if they want to change the world. And I think that this is an unsustainable situation in which the decision makers are not selected out of the few good, but out of the few who are willing to have a very bad reputation and actually have the interest of getting the benefit of, of doing politics. And the third question, I agree with you, we have a very gender unbalanced uh, global scene. Uh, uh, trying to speak about it without uh, being seen as self-interested. Uh, yeah, but I, I think that most of the big uh, actors in the international scene, they all have their aid programs. And they do a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, development programs. And I think that most of them have the gender aspect in, in it. So they say, OK, we will improve poverty, but we'll have to pay attention to the gender aspect. And we'll have to empower women. And, and we want to see more women in politics. And it all looks great on paper. And then you see the picture of G8. And if it was not for Germany, it would have been a completely male-dominated world. And uh, unfortunately, uh, no policy has been discussed to change this reality. Uh, so uh, I do think that we will have to accept uh, living in a more male-dominated global scene uh, than, than we would wish for. And I do hope that some of the positive examples, like the German one or several other new, newly elected prime ministers and presidents, will change the attitude. Because I think that some kind of uh, a gender balance will bring other kinds of balances in politics in terms of values, in terms of representation, in terms of democracy. Thank you.